Hi, and welcome to Affected, a podcast from me. For those of you who don't know me, we are a global life sciences talent provider. We've been connecting the industry for over a decade, and now we want to share some of our insights and experiences with you. We'll be hosting monthly episodes, sharing thoughts from our leaders and industry professionals about job hunting and hiring in life sciences, as well as giving our network a platform to share their own experiences of building successful careers in an industry that affects us all. Hi, and welcome to Affected. As always, I'm your host, Owen Bynum. Today, I'm joined by two of our most senior team members from our London office, Gu and Matt. Uh, could you tell me about yourselves, um, how you got to where you are now, and sort of your journey into recruitment and, and meet? Yeah, of course. So, uh, I'm Gu Led. Um call me Goo. Um, I've been with Meet since 2013 now really so kind of fell into recruitment through a friend. Um, I used to work for, well, I used to work at O2 before uh, before uni and during uni and after uni and then um, got recommended to get into recruitment through a friend and um, moved into Meet in 2013 and been here ever since. Nice, cool. Yeah, I'm Matt. Um, I'm one of our division directors for uh, a couple of our business units here in London, the main one being uh, the contract team. Um, I joined us eight years ago next month. Um, again, sort of fell into recruitment, friend of a friend of a friend, like uh, like most of us. Um, thought I'd only do recruitment for a couple of years and then find out what I really wanted to do. And yeah, kind of got the bug and really enjoyed um, the billing side of things. And then over time, transition more into the the manager and people development sort of leadership type role and um yeah um that's what i do now so eight years and 10 years in october 10 years so Uh, two old old heads of the uh, the company very old (laughs) old. (laughs) (laughs) um so today we're going to be looking at uh, what it takes to be a great candidate uh what can we do to stand out in in a crowded market especially during you know some of the more challenging economic times. Uh, during times like these, uh, I know it can feel extremely daunting stepping out into a job search and um, it may feel as if there are less job openings now as businesses sort of uh, scale back their team building and feel less confident in taking on new projects. However, you know, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. We're still doing deals. Uh, we had a bunch of deals come through today, which is amazing. So it's like, it's not as if there's no one being hired whatsoever. Um, and we appreciate at the moment, the market can feel stagnant, but you know, like I'm saying, there are still exciting opportunities out there for, for people who are willing to put in that little bit extra work to stand out. Um, so jumping straight in, um, what can our job do, job seekers do to, to stand out right now? I think for me, having a, uh, a standout LinkedIn profile is really important. Um, I love seeing interaction between candidates on LinkedIn, whether they're talking about a new regulation or a new standard that's being released and, you know, engaging in... Um, you know, really serious debate around uh, around that. And um, for me, that's really important, having um, references or recommendations on your LinkedIn profile, um, having a picture sounds silly, but I think that uh, adds a human, human element to um, to your job search. Clients and recruiters can, can see you, they can make it a bit more human rather than just a, just a CV. I remember you telling me a story about uh, you'd see one guy who was constantly sort of debating people. Mm. Um, and it, that's, it, to me, that was interesting because it was like that, that one person stuck in your mind. Mm. So it, it's almost as if like just being ingrained in your industry, sort of being, you know, being a voice within that space is important because it, it, people will remember you, whether, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe not for the best reasons, but they will, they will remember you. And I, I think that's probably half the battle really sometimes. Yeah, I think, um, and this contract I'm thinking of them now, they will of course remain nameless. Um, But it's sort of hypocritical because I cringe myself out if I start trying to really engage as a, um, you know, uh, uh, um, a profile on LinkedIn. It's just not me. It wouldn't be authentic if I did that. But I love seeing candidates do that. And um, they stick in your name for, they stick in your head for sure. If they're, you know, challenging others on perceptions and, you know, this particular candidate is always challenging a post about a regulation, whether it's uh, MDR or quality system, which is uh, sort of related to the markets that I used to do. So, yeah, seeing that, I, I love that. I think that's great. Um, I don't think it's the only thing to do to stand out in a crowded market, of course, um, but certainly 
certainly is engaging for, for us recruiters and clients. Yeah. So, Gu, let's, um, let's get down into sort of like the, the nitty gritty, the granular details. Yeah. When, we're, when we're looking at CVs here, what are, what are the key things you look for before we sort of send them out to the businesses we work with? Essentially, what does a good CV look like? Yeah, a very good question. I think for, for, from a perm point of view, or I guess even contract as well, really, um, your CV is the first impression a, client, a company um, are going to have of you. So really what we like to, to, to make sure that we talk to candidates about is to have a relatively short CV. So from a kind of a basic point of view, two, maximum three pages. We sometimes do get CVs where we have people who've got 15, 16 pages. And if you've got to think a line manager has very limited amount of time to review profiles alongside doing their own job, they want to make sure they can see a good profile, good CV experience, but relatively short. So two to three pages I would recommend. Um, and the way that I would break it down in terms of how it's written, what you want is a reverse chronological, obviously starting with your first experience, finishing up with the most recent role. And then I tend to recommend people to write a few bullet points of the responsibilities, but on top of that, achievements. What I think is really important is talking about where you have saved comp- a company money, where you've been able to make the money, what are the achievements you've had within each of those roles, and that will allow you to stand out in comparison to other candidates. That's really important. Um, you also obviously want to put any education details, any additional information, but I'd say two to three C, uh, pages, extensive experience and achievement sections, and education, and then anything else you think is relevant for the role. Um, I always try and make sure that people are tailoring their job search to the role they're, they're looking for. So if a CV is, let's say, towards a job that is specific in an area in GXP, for example, from a quality point of view, you want it to be specific to that. Sometimes candidates will have very general CVs and then more specific ones. So always prefer the specific ones for per job. Yeah, and Matt, for contractors, I mean, some of these, the, some of the people you work with, they've had hundreds and hundreds of projects. What, what, what sort of... What, what, what sort of advice would you say to them in terms of sort of like putting down those kinds of things? Yeah, I'd say just picking up on Goo's comment, yeah. the achievements I think is really important. The scope of the project that you were brought in to do and what you achieved during that time. I think me and Goo, the old heads that we are, been in recruitment now for a while between us and we've seen so many CVs and the best ones are always the ones that are really clear in terms of why they were hired for the company, what the scope of the project was and what they achieved within that. Um, and, you know, versus the kind of more red flags, which would be, you know, just a bunch of keywords, which doesn't really mean anything. And a hiring manager will always see through, you know, I could write a good CV. I could probably get through a first stage telephone interview in quality and regula- uh, regulatory, if I can say the word right, regulatory in medical technology. Like, But, um, you know, being able to talk through, like I said, the project and the what you achieved in that, I think, is the next step. And like Goose says, that is the first impression you give a client. So if you're able to really clearly talk through what you've achieved in a in a client that uh, for a project, sorry, in a project for a client, then I think that's going to go a long way in terms of how you'll translate that for the actual client itself. You know, how can you really clearly speak about your ideas define them and then implement them for a business i think that goes a long way yeah do you ever um do you ever get any pushback from from candidates when you're sort of you know asking them to make maybe make these amendments to their cvs you know maybe take some stuff out they're kind of maybe a little bit precious about yeah yeah we do and i understand why um again people will be in jobs um they'll have families they won't necessarily have time to keep amending a CV to each individual job. So we could clearly understand why people want, might not want to do it. Um, and we have had pushbacks where people say, listen, my CV tells a story, it tells my story, and we're not disagreeing with that in the slightest. We just want to give you the best chance possible to secure, secure you the interview, and then you can give that impression of what you've done, tell the story of the projects, etc. you've done. So yeah, absolutely, I think it's understandable why people do pushback mainly because of time issues. But again, we're only trying to make sure that people are getting the chance to get that interview in the first place. I remember you telling me a story about someone who'd paid quite a substantial amount of money to have a, a CV written. Yeah, no, I, um, I met a candidate when I was out in the States um, who'd paid an agency, some sort of con um, artist, clearly paid them like $300 to write their CV and um, they sent it to me and it was just the, your standard looking CV. So, um, you know, that, that was a bit crazy to me. Yeah, and that was a bit silly. Um, 
yeah i think i think just sort of just be authentic and, and be concise yeah. get to the point and sort of yeah like our job is not to uh recreate a profile or embellish um a profile or make something stand out more than it should we're just trying to help tell a candidate's story um we're not trying to you know our role is not to to change the type of people that we're putting together we're, we're just trying to help them present themselves in a better way and that's where i think our our value comes in um so yeah yeah um so you finally get an interview mm -hmm. um what key bits of advice do you have for, for this part of the job search um yeah one of the benefits of working with the recruiter especially um from from outside of my team specifically we make sure that we prep every candidate for every single interview they go through um, because a first interview is going to be different to a second to a third vice versa so part of the service that we provide to candidates is to make sure they understand what the interview will consist of um, who they'll be meeting type of person that will be um, the structure of the interview so um, yeah we, we just make sure that that person feels as prepared as possible to do well again so the key things that I would recommend for someone to do is to make sure very basic is know your CV inside out um, again, that goes back to writing your CV, not getting it written for you, um, making sure that you're able to elaborate on the points you've written on there. So again, the achievements and responsibilities, again, tailoring it to the job that you're looking for as well. So again, don't talk about projects or maybe responsibilities that aren't worthwhile or might not be important to this particular role. Um, being personable, the human touch is really important. People do want to work with people that they like. Um, so a lot of the feedback that we get from our clients is it's equally as important that we get on with the person and they're a good culture fit and value and mission fit as they are a technical fit. So again, we're just able to support that person, make a good impression when they're in front of the managers. Yeah, I think that's one thing that gets overlooked maybe a little bit is, is the idea of that cultural mm -hmm. fit. You're going to be sort of hopefully with a company, especially on the permanent side for, yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And you want to be with people who sort of buy into the same ethos as you, you know, have the same goals. I, it, I, to me, that's probably the most important part of, of that job search. Um, with contractors, doubles, how, do they, how does that sort of process differ slightly? Yeah, I think um, whilst it's still a job search, it's still uh, a goal to, you know, assess capabilities for someone to fit into a role and into a business. It is slightly more tailored towards a technical um, project fit rather than perhaps the more softer side around long-term motivations, um, values, alignment. I think contracts, whilst it still has that, you know, we don't necessarily want real mercenary contractors who are just there to pick up a, uh, you know, a decent hourly or daily rate. Um, there is still that little bit of, of you know, values. Are, are you aligned to this business, particularly within life sciences, where everyone seems to have that core motivation to affect patient outcomes which i think is really cool but um yeah it is much more around right we have this piece of work um and assessing the the skill set and capabilities um to to complete that in as efficient a time as possible um there's a lot more focus i'd say for just going back to to see these around testimonials within contracting as well particularly within our team you know people are paying a lot of money for contracts you know whether it's you know some of these people are getting paid huge um, amounts per hour or per day so having a positive testimony from a previous um, hiring manager or project lead for us is really important to really just verify that skill set um, there's a lot of contractors out there and not as many jobs um, so you know we really want our candidates to stand out from the crowd and positive testimonies and being able to um, you know really use those as part of that application process whether at phone screen interview or, or at offer stage is, is really important for us. I think one of the things that's like often overlooked with, with contractors is sort of like the value add they can can bring to the business outside of sort of just their technical skill set. Some of these guys have, have been around for, for years and years and years to say like hundreds of projects having someone come in who can sort of offer a a different point of view and, and be like sort of a, a a wider scope of knowledge from just outside of um that project i, I think is invaluable like so i think like 
being a successful contractor in, in this difficult market, not only is it helping, you know, the person looking for that job, but it can it can also be a massive benefit for the company they end up sort of being placed into. Yeah, hundred percent. The best contractors are the ones that, yes, are a great technical fit and have been there, seen there, done it, but the ones that know how to really communicate effectively to a, a brand new startup who's a spin out from, you know, Oxford or Cambridge or any other university, um, who, yes, may be very um, technically unaware in certain aspects of bringing a device or product to market um, in, in thinking of med tech, um, but are incredibly switched on and smart individuals. So the best contractors are the ones that can manage that um uh, sort of knowledge transfer and understand that, um, you know, whilst these individuals might not be experts within quality and regulatory, they are experts in, you know, um, proton beam and bringing that into a medical device. So it's, um, yeah, the best contractors are the ones that are able to manage that relationship with the client. Um, and that's, it's a skill, you know, I think I'd really struggle at that, banging my head against the brick wall that people can't put together a CE submission or an FDA submission. But um, yeah, it takes a lot of emotional intelligence, I think, being a, a good contractor. Yeah. Um, so let's get into the nitty gritty then. Um, I think essentially what I want to ask is outside of skill set, outside of just the, the technical ability, what is it that you think makes a good job seeker a good candidate right now in this in this market what makes a good candidate to me is someone who has first of all really good good clear communication skills um the reason that is important is it's great to have done all these different projects different work over the years but not being able to communicate that effectively wouldn't allow you to stand out um another one is someone with really clear expectations of what they want but with a degree of flexibility and what i mean by that is Again, we can have sometimes candidates that we speak to just say, I'm open to anything, I'm open to any job, any company, etc. And that is a little bit of a red flag because on a permanent side, at least, you're going to be working for that company for a few years. There must be something that you're passionate about, that you're looking for. So someone who has really clear expectations of what they're looking for in terms of type of company, uh, type of role they want to be in, type of team they want to be part of is really important. But at the same time, being able to show some flexibility on some of it. One of the things I've mentioned is a house. When you're buying a house, an analogy, um, you might have an idea that you want a four bedroom house, front garden, back garden, an office room, a downstairs gym, and then you go see a house that has all of those things, but it's still missing something. Again, there might be that actually, I'm happy with three bedroom house and I'll take all the rest. So it's having really clear expectation, but showing a degree of flexibility because there could be a perfect job out there, but could there also be a, a really great job that you'd be missing out because you're not maybe being flexible on one thing. So good communication skills, clear expectations um, are probably two of the, the most important things for me. Yeah, yeah, I love that house analogy. Um, it's really good. I wish I had one that was equally as smart, but I don't. Uh, yeah, transparency, I guess I'd add to that. Um, you know, uh, a great candidate is someone that's super transparent, not just with us as, as the recruiter, obviously, but also with the client. I've definitely had a few candidates miss out on opportunities where they, they just weren't properly transparent with the client in terms of would they accept a permanent position? Would they also look at a senior director or board level role, not just contracting role? And um, yeah, not being upfront about that um, in the first instance can sometimes lead you to miss out on opportunities. So, um, you know, the last thing you want is for people to miss out on, on roles that they would actually prefer to, to take. So yeah, definitely transparency from all parties. And you'll, you I expect that same level of service from us, um, as recruiters as well, whether that's giving feedback or being really honest with, with candidates, you know, about a, an interview, you know, we'd love to say that every interview went really well with all our candidates and clients but but some don't so I think having the integrity to be honest about that from our side and from the the candidate side is is equally important listen it's it's understandable how stressful the the job searching process can be um I mean we, we've all had to go through it at, at some point and it's it's never the easiest thing in the world unless you're one of those sort of super lucky human beings who just sort of walks into an amazing situation and, and never looks back um are there anything that our listeners should be aware of before they sort of embark on their on their journey? Yeah, um, 100%. I think it can be a really difficult 
thing to keep searching for jobs and keep keep being told no. Um, I think rejection isn't a nice thing to have to go through. And I think unfortunately when you are going um, through a job search, you, you will be getting more rejections than not, unfortunately. So um, organization is something that I really recommend to people. And what I mean by that is being really clear um, on where you have applied, when you've applied, how you've done it, um, keeping a track of it. I'd always recommend people just to create themselves an Excel sheet where they can make sure that they're consistently following up as well. So if they've made an application, they've not heard back for a week, make sure you follow up with the point of contact you're working with, whether that's a recruiter, a TA person or direct. Um, yeah, so that allows you to make sure that you're aware where your application is going, what the status of it is, you can chase across. And then it means if another recruiter speaks to you about a job at that company, you can just be really clear and say up front, hey, <clears throat> I've not applied there before, or I have applied there, so I don't think we should proceed. We do sometimes get candidates who we've submit to jobs who've said maybe they're not applied for jobs before, and companies come back and say, hey, they applied three, four, six months ago, whatever. So again, you just want to make sure you're making good impression and duplicating applications, etc. It's something that I would recommend not to do. But being super organized up front, knowing exactly where your application is going is definitely something I would re would recommend to do. I think like a lot of people re realize that, that the process can be quite long and quite mm -hmm. arduous. Is, is that always necessarily true for the contract side of things? No, not always. Um, contract on the whole can be very fast moving and usually is only a one stage process um, from an interview point of view with um, with our, our clients. So um, yeah, my advice to, to candidates going into contracting is be prepared for a quick process. You know, we can um, receive a job from a client on the Thursday, have an interview aligned for or, or interview set up for the Friday, and then that person can be starting on the Monday. And that does happen fairly frequently. So um, contractors who are, you know, have been contracting for many years, they usually uh, they're usually used to that. And they're used to that quick, uh, quick pace of things. Um, but those going from, you know, permanent into contracting, if that's their first contract and they're looking to make that step, suddenly that can take people by surprise. So we're used to managing, um, you know, that and being clear of expectations. You know, it will never come to a surprise uh, for us as the recruiters because we will have um, taken a really formal um, job spec and understood that the client is willing to make a decision off this next video call or telephone call um teams call these days um so yeah no it moves a lot quicker um and you have to be prepared to be able to start quicker as well obviously um we often hear from our clients that they want someone yesterday that is um that is really important though being able to start quickly um so you know those going into contracting for the first time you know, with a three-month notice period, it's a bit of a non-starter, I would say, for most most of our clients. Not all, but most. Um, so, yeah, be prepared for a, a quick interview process, a quick start. I guess I guess sometimes availability is the best ability, right? Just, yeah. Just being, being That's a there big there factor really. in a job search for a contractor. You know, it's often the first question, when are they available from? If we say, well, not for another four weeks, then, you know, that's four weeks. Is quite That's a long time lag for... A company to know that they really need to spend this money on this service and not have that being done and you know all sorts can happen in that four weeks someone can come off the market or come back on the market and then um you know an internal reference can start straight away and actually you know we have had people miss out on opportunities because their availability is is um is not quick enough so yeah it's a, it's a really key factor Okay, so let's uh, let's talk recruiters, and I feel like we're going to be somewhat biased here. But why 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 use us? What what sort of what what exactly is it we can do for you in in aiding your search? Yeah, I think in addition to the things we spoke about, things like helping with CVs, preparing for interviews, I think the amount of market knowledge an individual recruiter has is extensive. Um, daily, we're making however many calls to managers to to candidates to understand who's looking, what they're looking for. Um, so first of all, the amount of knowledge you'll be able to understand and get from a, a recruiter is is huge. And I would really recommend to, to make sure you are working with recruiters and good recruiters as well. Um, so that's definitely an important thing. Um, again, in th terms of things like the day-to-day -day part of the recruitment process, again, it's quite a stressful situation. Being able to help with CV, um, 
review amendments, interview preparation, communication, organizing interviews. There's lots of things that actually go into the whole recruiting process. So we're able to talk and support a candidate through that. It sounds strange, but we know that you know how to, to do your job, right? I, essentially, what we're trying to do is just put you in the best possible position to succeed, mm -hmm. you know, put you in front of the right, right uh, life sciences companies and sort of maybe, you know, offer you a, a, a foot in where it might have been slightly more difficult to if, it, if you weren't sort of using our network, mm -hmm. essentially. What about from a, a contracting side of things? Yeah, similar. Like, uh, this is our job. This is what we wake up to do every day. Um, so, you know, what what I had to understand when I got into life sciences recruitment was we're not meant to be experts in life sciences, in quality, in pharma, in biotech, you know, in quality and regulatory, in medical technology. That's not my job to be an expert in all the submissions, the standards, you know, it's great to have that knowledge and building that up is key to being better at what we do. But we are experts in the recruitment side. Um, that's where we add value. Um, so, yeah, for me, working with two or three really great agencies at a time, don't work with everyone. Um, I would always encourage a candidate to limit themselves. And, I, you know, if that's us, great. If it's someone that you know, you've known for years and years then and you trust them, then great. That's that's also fine. But you know, we have um, uh, meet 14 years or so of purely life sciences experience. So you'd hope within that time, we've amassed quite a good network of life science companies that uh, have know us, that trust us, um, and that we can, can add value to with connecting the right people. So yeah, for us, it's a full time job. I'd love it if you know, the industry could all connect each other and um, and recruit for themselves. But we just know that that's not possible. You know, clients and candidates have got, um, you know, a very small bandwidth to think about recruitment. You know, they're out there creating some amazing, innovative, life-saving products and, and taking those to market. Our job is to do the recruitment. Um, so hopefully that's where we can, can add value. Yeah. We we also take care of like some of the the administrative stuff as well. I mean, I I know um, our our contract team here has sort of uh, an inbuilt compliance team, which is just how invaluable is that for a, for a yeah. contractor? Yeah, uh, my good pal Banksy. Um, yes, we um, no, he's he's amazing though. Alex Banks, our compliance manager, um, always makes sure we're doing things by the book, and um, whether that's setting up a contractor with the right documentation, um, uh, whether that's in, you know, Europe, in the US, uh, more globally, um, you know, he's always there to make sure that we're doing things properly, that we are taking the risk away from the client. Um, if it's a particular contract chain, we need to be aware of if it's a particular umbrella company solution. Um, you know, we are quite extensive in that because we know that if we get that wrong, that exposes us, it exposes the client and it exposes the, the contractor. So compliance, whether that's IR35, Swiss um, laws around labor leasing um, or just company setups, limited company setups, sole trader, whether it's France, Armenia, Germany, every country has their slight nuance and... Um, I think working with a, a recruiter that has a really good back office within contract is so important. And I always think, what would I want from a recruiter in this situation? And if I was going into contracting and I didn't have a background in contract recruitment, so I don't know what it is, I would always want an agency like Meet that is not willing to take risks when it comes to compliance, always looking to uh, make sure that we take that away from the, the contractors and the clients and uh, we work with the right umbrella companies, um, the right contract chain and, um, and setups within each, um, within each country as well. So I would always, you know, prefer a company challenging me if I want to set up in a particular sole trader um, set up in a particular country um, because ultimately we're not here to stop contracts happening. We want them to happen. That's our job. But we are there to protect clients and, and candidates from tax implications, from any other um, compliance um, issues that might, might arise during an engagement. Yeah. 
I, I, it's, I, I didn't realize how, like prior to, prior to working with you guys, just how complicated all that back, that back office stuff can, can be. And I, I honestly don't envy Alex <laughs> in this life. He's, good at what he he's, does. he's pretty he's very good. good at what he does. Um, finally, guys, can you give our listeners just some advice on how to stay motivated throughout this process? You know, you've heard a couple of no's. Um, maybe you're thinking, oh, man, I, maybe I need to speak to someone right now. What, what kind of what kind of things would you would you say to them to just to just to keep them going? Yeah, so I think um, you know during a, a tougher market, a tougher economic environment, it's really important to to obviously stay positive during a search. You want to go into every interview, every application process with a really positive mindset, and it's easy to, you know, when you've received lots of no's, to take those no's to heart and not put your best foot forward. And I always say to my team. Look, if we are working fewer jobs than we've had in the last couple of years, then we need to make sure that we cover all bases and be extra on top of our game during that application um, and that job search. So, you know, same thing goes to, to candidates, really. Make sure that, OK, if this is the one application you've got at the moment, let's absolutely cover all bases. Make sure that we give ourselves the best chance to be successful there. So that would certainly be something that I'd encourage. Um you know, during downtimes, it's also, I, I would say, okay, go and do that um, course that you've been putting off for a while. Go and get that certification in, you know, a new quality management system or, um, you know, a new training that's going to boost your profile. Um, don't be afraid to just take time out of the um, the market for a little bit um, and, um, and improve yourself. You know, that could be in a variety of ways. Could be simple things like, getting into exercise a bit more you know I'd love to dedicate more time to to that if I had so contractors they tend to have that flexibility of not needing to work every day of the year some of them so um yeah that's that's kind of what I would suggest yeah and to add to that I would um I don't mean I don't mean to sound patronizing the slightest but but don't give up because <clears throat> there will be a job out there I think uh people are hard-working honest who want to make sure they apply themselves effectively will, will find something. And what you've got to do is got to make sure that you're putting that extra application and you're chasing that recruiter, you're being really organized with your, um, with your search. So going back to what we talked about earlier, being organized in knowing where exactly the application has gone, following up consistently, because again, that person who might have received your CV might have been interested, but for some other reason got distracted. So that follow up, the second, the third, is actually that reminder that you are genuinely interested in that business or something that you want and and the desire that consistency that application makes you stand out in comparison to people who aren't doing that so don't give up keep yourself organized and keep yourself honest on, on yeah. the search uh, and i get it like no one wants to be a, a candidate might feel a little bit uncomfortable in terms of chasing constantly i don't want to come off desperate um and there is an element of pride there but um, you know, the market is a little bit different to what it was a couple of years ago, you know, so and it, it will come in cycles, you know, a little bit. Um, so you, you have to be willing sometimes to maybe put yourself out there a little bit more than you did when you were getting, you know, 10 calls a day from every recruiter and um, and all these job offers coming your way. It's it's currently um, not that type of environment. So. You have to um, be prepared to, like Goose says, follow up a couple of times maybe. You know, we we certainly have to do that in our role and you wouldn't believe how many times we've made placements and put great people into great businesses after initially our clients ignored the CV because they were too busy or just didn't quite pick it up or didn't realise how good the candidate actually was. So, um, yeah, never be too proud to... To follow up and I, I get the hesitancy in doing that I, I really do but um, that would be my advice right now in, in this uh, in this market and the other thing I'd say is um, if you are working with you know a, a company like us um, really rely on your recruiter lean on them you know keep them honest be honest with them and sort of don't put everything on on you on yourself um, use use the network that these guys have use their experience and I can, it can, I'm sure it can feel like therapy sometimes when you're when you're talking with some of your candidates. Yeah, you've got to just try and make sure they're using all the tools possible. That is an agency, that is direct applications, that is going on LinkedIn. As we talked about, making sure that your profile stands out, making sure you're t getting in touch with your network. Who do you know? Which good people have you worked with previously who would give 
good testimonials on you, could they recommend you to people within those businesses? So there's so many different tools out there and you've got to be consistent across all of them rather than just focus on one and hope that that's the way that you're going to get through. So yeah, that's where it talks about the organization, keeping yourself honest, making sure that you're using your network to the, to the maximum capacity. Yeah, I've definitely had a few conversations with contractors over the years that I've placed, you know, numerous times or have, you know, had really good relationships with who have definitely, you know, said to me, wow, Matt, I'm, I'm talking to you more than I talk to my wife right now. Like, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe we just uh, put this on ice for a little bit. So, look, you do tend to, if you've worked in the industry, as, as I keep saying this, as long as we have, you tend to build relationships with great people and there are great people in our industry so you know if I was a, a contractor or someone looking to further my permanent career I would focus on that relationship build with the right recruiters um, and make sure that you're standing out in their mind as much as, as possible because ultimately you want to have good recruiters working for you. I can't thank you guys enough for um for, for agreeing to I, I know I know I sort of grab you guys and throw you in front of the camera an awful lot so I really appreciate that and I think I think there's some really really valuable bits of advice in there that the market at the moment isn't isn't as fluid and as, as strong as it, as it has been um, especially you know post pandemic but it's it's not to say that those opportunities aren't there and, and we're we're doing everything we can as a company to make sure that you find that dream job or or you, we we can get you that best candidate possible. I've, uh, I've got the man, the myth, the legend that is Paul Banks on. Um, nice. I'm, I'm off to New York in a couple of weeks and he's the, uh, he's the next. He'll be much more fun than yeah. that. Do you think, do you think <laughs> so? Any advice for him? Uh, he's a lot more, uh, I think he's just, personality is much better than us, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's just a, he's better at recruitment, <laughs> he's more fun. Um, no, he's be, probably a bit more natural in front of Cameron. No, he'll be great. He's good, good. Yeah, you'll enjoy it. I think that's the perfect, perfect uh, note for us to sign on. So <laughs> thank, thank you so much to you guys. And we'll see you next month with a, another episode of Affected. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.